Hi, it's Wesley with 22 Zines. I'm going to be doing some folding today um, because summer is zine season. I've had these unfolded tarot zines sitting in my drawer just forever. And I've uh, got to start getting ready for zine fests and arts markets and all these things where I'm going to need to have physical zines ready. Um, I will say that it gets incredibly boring to just do this all by yourself. It's sort of relaxing and, and almost meditative in a way to fold zines and get them all get them all ready for assembly. But at the same time, I just did a big batch of uh, like 50 of the Judgment Zine, and now I'm on to Six of Swords and I'm just like super bored. So what I thought was that I could just sort of bring you guys along with me and subject you to my zine folding adventures while chatting just about some zine stuff. And uh, yeah, so what I'm doing right now, um, by the way, is I the tarot zines that I have are, their actual size is going to be about there, so I've got to cut off this top piece. So that's kind of step one. And I have this little marker here on this paper cutter. I used to do all these with scissors. And holy crap, like, if you've never cut thousands and thousands of zines by hand with scissors, then you don't understand just the sheer joy that I got when I finally caved and bought this, like, $30 paper cutter. I was always kind of hesitant and reluctant to actually buy it because um, I just felt like... I didn't want to have to spend all this money on um, replacement blades, and I just was kind of stubborn about it and being like, I don't have to have any special tools to make zines, but man, now that I have this, it just makes my life so much easier. I mean, most of my zines don't even require cutting, but the, the tarot zines do, and man... It just helps so much. I feel like it's freed me up. <laughs> I still do hand cutting with scissors for almost everything else, though. Anyway, the main topic that I was that's kind of been on my mind and that I thought this would be a good opportunity to just sort of chat about is that um, I feel like I've found it a whole lot easier to talk about tarot and tarot decks than to talk about zines. And like when I first made this channel you know, part of the reason that I call it 22 Zines, I mean, for one, because that's just kind of an existing name that I already had for my zine project, and I wanted to, you know, not have to come up with a new name, and just to connect it to that, but also because I wanted to make some zine content on YouTube that was sort of inspired by the thriving TarotTube community, um, because I feel like a lot of the things that TarotTube does, you could do the same sort of thing with zines, about doing reviews and flip-throughs, and um, showing off your zine collection, and doing zine tags if there were enough people doing it, and, you know, all these really awesome, fun questions and things that make the tarot tube universe really engaging, I thought this would be a really awesome thing for zines. I mean, there's, like, book tube, and there's tarot tube, so why not a zine tube? Um... And something kind of strange that happened, I guess, is that I realized I have such an easier time talking about tarot decks than I do about zines. Um, I also have kind of a hard time talking about books in comparison to tarot, um, but I guess it feels a little easier. I don't know. I just feel like there are some particulars about zines that make them really hard to discuss um, or to really capture properly in, um, in conversation or in video format or whatever. So I don't really have a plan or I don't totally know what it is, but I've had a few ideas just swimming around in my head about what that might have to do with, like what the deal might be. Um, so I guess I'll just chitter-chatter and see if we can come up with anything. So before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and start folding these covers. I like to fold them one at a time and then crease them with scissors. 
Um, because these are cardstock, I definitely have to crease them, but I also like creasing my um, regular paper insides. You'll see how it goes. So, I guess the thing about zines that, to me, makes them hard to talk about... Um, actually, you know what? Let's start by saying what makes tarot decks so easy to talk about, and what makes tarot tubes so, so sort of... Um, easy to make videos on, at least for me, and and fun and easy to talk about. For one, the fact that there is already a giant thriving community from which to take inspiration is huge. So people making tarot tags all the time, people making videos about their deck collections, and generally just like all of the amazing conversations and tarot videos that are happening out there, it does make it significantly easier to get inspiration, um, even if I don't end up making VRs or making things that are in direct response. It's like, it's just a lot, it's a lot easier when you have a lot of other people kind of doing, doing the thing that you're doing, you know? Uh, and the, so there's not a whole lot of zine YouTube happening, and at least in comparison, and that does make it a little harder to come up with things on things on on your own to talk about. Um, I think the other thing that makes tarot really easy to talk about is that there's kind of a there's a there's already a secret language, I guess, that tarot users can speak to each other and this base of knowledge that we can use when we're discussing tarot in the sense that tarot is a structured thing. We can sort of um, reference that structure in how we talk about things. So we can talk about why we might like the court cards in this particular deck and why it makes the court cards um, easy to read or my, makes the court cards come alive and that will make sense and that will resonate with a lot of people because there's sort of a general um, understanding about what is a court card why is it that um, court cards are are especially or, or notoriously difficult to read um, and we sort of have this cultural for one we have this lexicon just simply referring to the uh, tarot decks themselves about, you know, majors, minors, pips, um, indie versus mass market, um, you know, different art styles, collage, whatever, um, little white book, uh, court cards, suits, suit renaming. We sort of, we have this gigantic lexicon that we can rely on when uh, describing tarot decks that a lot of other things don't have, or at least don't have to that extent. Oh my god, I got totally weird deja vu right there. <laughs> um, I guess that's not unusual because I fold scenes a lot. Um, so yeah, that is something that makes tarot really unique and really uh, easy and fun to talk about. Another thing about talking about tarot and talking about tarot decks is that it's almost expected that we are going to see all of the cards of a particular deck. Um, this, this sort of extends even to the phase of creation in the sense that I think Lisa Pepez in probably an anti-haul or a this or that video, I can't remember, probably an anti-haul, was talking about how Tarot uh, lovers are are sort of spoiled in a sense in their in the way that tarot kickstarters work because for almost every other type of Kickstarter, it's not generally expected that you would have all of the art or all of the work finished before you do the Kickstarter. The idea is that the Kickstarter is supposed to fund the work, and people will wait for it. With tarot decks on Kickstarter. This is a very different culture where it's it's generally expected or assumed that all of the tarot deck images are going to be completed before the Kickstarter launches. And if it doesn't, that kind of raises some, some eyebrows <laughs> among people who are potentially going to back it. And I agree. I've seen tarot decks that I... Um, 
considered and if it doesn't have all the images even if I really like the images that are shown even if it seems that you know I have no reason to doubt that the images will get finished even if it seems like yeah they have a good solid chunk of them done and I'm not gonna be waiting years and years for you know 76 more images to be created or something I still am kind of hesitant I suppose to back a tarot deck that doesn't have all the images why is that um it might be because tarot decks are so personal and people have so many different associations and and kind of um needs I guess for each of the card images so that you know people will have deal breaker cards for example and that's sort of a generally understood thing that many people do have in the sense that if they don't like the way that one particular card is depicted that will ruin a deck for them or that will essentially severely limit their enjoyment of the deck right um and ultimately would probably lead to them deciding not to purchase a deck or not to, not to back a deck um but aside from, and i guess aside from that there's also this assumption that tarot decks in particular will take a really long time to create which is true um i guess i just i'll have to think more about if they really would take that much more time than you know say a, a 78 page comic book like would you see a 78 page comic book on um kickstarter and be hesitant if only 40 of the pages were done i feel like probably not at least you know the the sort of culture of of comic artists and the, the culture of, of funding comics on kickstarter doesn't have such an emphasis on completion anyway so like the whole point that I bring all that up is that um, we as as tarot readers and as and as um, people on tarot tube talking about tarot decks uh, there's a general understanding that we are gonna know what all the images look like and that the all of the images on a particular deck all of the cards are going to be generally viewable or accessible there will be flip throughs of a deck that you can find on youtube or you know on kickstarters there will be every single image in the deck shown you know perhaps at a low resolution but that it will be shown um and i think that that is that is very different from a lot of things because it means that tarot people aren't especially concerned with spoilers they aren't especially concerned about surprises or wanting to, um, you know, like, like you wouldn't have someone be upset that, oh, how could you show the world card? You know, that's the end of the deck <laughs> or something like that. Or you would, you wouldn't have someone saying, you know, no spoilers or, or tag their videos as, as spoiler alert. I'm showing images of this deck. Like, it's just kind of assumed that the images are out there, you're going to see them, you're going to be able to see them, and the actual experience of working with the deck um, is not going to be inhibited and, and is per perhaps going to be enhanced by um, having seen the card images beforehand, or at least, like, your decision to, um, excuse me, your decision to purchase the deck is is going to be helped not hindered um in comparison to books and i think to a certain extent zines where there is sort of a a spoiler culture i don't know how to put that and i don't think it's quite as prevalent in zines as it is in books and and movies but like there's just this idea that like I, at least i have this idea that when i'm sharing a zine I don't want to share too much of it. I need to share exactly the right amount to truly capture the zine and capture the zine's essence and like encourage people to go out and pick it up and read it for themselves. But I don't want to 
spoil any any big moments, any really incredible quotes, anything that would. Um, I don't want to say anything that would potentially detract from the person discovering it themselves when they are reading the zine in the same way that you wouldn't want to go around saying, um, I don't know, I can't even, I can't think of a, a book spoiler that everybody is talking about, because <laughs> um, I'm kind of out of the loop in that sense, but, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to have to worry about about spoilers if you're listening to a book review for example like you certainly wouldn't want someone to say here's what happened at the end of this book and that again it's just it's just a very different culture from tarot cards um the other thing that is sort of something that i always feel like i need to be wary of or concerned about and it, it's something that makes it a little harder to talk about zines sometimes is that I don't want to give too much information about the zine, because zines are very short things in comparison to books. Um, like with a book, you could probably post an entire chapter of a book, or or even just read aloud an entire chapter of a book, and um, it, for one, probably would still count as as being, you know, reproducing the work for review purposes and it wouldn't be seen as a big deal. And in general, from the listeners or readers of your review, it wouldn't be seen as that big a deal um, because you're just providing more information about the book and giving a flavor of what it, what it reads like so that people can decide if they want to get it on their own or not. I feel like in zines, they're so short that it's really difficult to do that. Like, like, let's just take a mini zine, for example, an eight page mini zine that's made out of a single sheet of paper. How the fuck are you supposed to talk about that without spoiling the contents of the mini zine? Like, what is there to say? Because anything that you say or, or any, any pages that you show or any examples that you give, you know, if you open up the page and show one two page spread, you're showing a third of the zine, basically. So how the heck do you talk about it without without spoiling it? And I feel like I didn't I didn't quite get here. I was I was starting to get there with my train of thought, but I didn't quite get there, is that the reason why it's especially important, I think, not to spoil zines also is because the creators are individuals. The creators are trying to sell or share their zines. Um and it's kind of like um, piracy or oversharing zines is kind of a bigger deal because it there's sort of a greater effect that it has on the creator. Like, if you shared... Like, how do I put this? Let's say that you just took the entire text of a book or the majority of the text of a book and you posted it, you know for people to download in PDF form somewhere. Like, for a mass market book, you probably shouldn't do that because it'll get you in legal trouble and because it does have an effect on the author. But at the same time, it's like, well, people are very likely able to find this book in a library. Or um, if someone does download and read this book illegally, it's like, it's a mass market publisher or mass market producer, and so, um, their reach is going to be larger as it is. Um, so your individual instance of um, piracy or whatever you want to call it, I guess it does it count as piracy if you're the one uploading, whatever. You're like your your particular instance of sharing this is kind of just a drop in the bucket. Like it's not that big a deal. Um, for things like zines that are indie publications that very rarely, if ever, will break like a like hundred readers. Like that is huge. If someone manages to sell a hundred of a particular zine, that's, that's very good. That's very impressive. Um, and they should, be, they should be happy with that and proud of that. And, and they are. They being zinesters. Like then if you consider that you're doing a review of it and you 
inadvertently end up oversharing or or you intentionally share kind of the entire work then you are you are sort of taking away a lot more potential um sales for that person and and it's it's sort of especially important because the sales that person makes are you know zines are not really money makers um but a lot of zinesters are indie creators and are trying to get as much as they possibly can out of their passion um to su to support themselves and to be able to continue doing their passion so it just is like it feels like it has a greater impact if i overshare or share too much about a zine because i definitely would not want to prevent any possible um person going out and and finding a zine for themselves like if if they're if i've managed to pique their interest of a zine um i want to pique it enough that the person that the person watching my video is going to go out and get it for themselves not so much that they feel like they've basically already read the zine by hearing my review and therefore don't need to bother to go and support the creator and that is a very fine delicate line to draw sometimes and it makes it a little bit difficult to talk about zines because in some ways when you're when you're talking about a tarot deck even if you don't have that much to say you can kind of just op you know flip through the deck and still produce a very visually interesting and 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 just a very interesting video just in kind of showing off what you notice about the artwork um but you can't exactly do the same thing okay how do i do this here we go i have to try and keep these in order and sometimes i forget if i've flipped it over or not you can't exactly do the same thing with the zine or at least it, it just feels harder it feels like i have to be more thoughtful and so it does make it more difficult i think to talk about zines so I think that is kind of a big component of it. The other thing, like, and frankly, it's a component that I kind of get annoyed by because I do, I love zinesters and of course I want to support zinesters and, and help drive people to their zine store and all that, but I also, I don't want to just be advertising, you know, I don't want to be advertising for these um okay here i've done it again and i can't i can't remember which way it goes whatever i'm sure i'll figure it out <laughs> how does this go i think it goes that way <laughs> okay whatever it does not go that way it goes this way crap Okay, I'm so <laughs> I'm sorry. These are getting a little messed up here. I think this is going to be my last cut for a little while, and I'll start folding these. <laughs> anyway. Okay, chatting. What was I saying? I don't want my channel, and I don't want my my sharing of zines to turn into advertising for people. Because on the one hand, it's like, I do want to advertise in the sense that I want to get the word out there. But I don't want to advertise in the sense that I don't want my channel and I don't I don't I don't want my discussions about zines to turn into go buy this, go buy this, go buy this, you know, go buy this zine, go buy this or that. Because I'm not into that, and that's kind of why I am into zines in the first place, is because in general it feels more um anti-capitalist. And I guess it's it's just such a difficult balance sometimes to be like both anti-capitalist but also supporting small artists and and sometimes it feels like those values are in conflict a little bit um I don't know like does that even make sense does it sound stupid just to say out loud of like you know of course it's not anti-capitalist to want to support a small indie creator or have other people support them but at the same time, I just kind of wish that all zines could be free and that everything could just be available out there for everybody to find and download and read. And um, if you like it, you chip a few bucks into the creator and that allows them to continue sharing their zines for free. 
And that is the model that I'm shifting towards. I am currently in the process of um, scanning and uploading all of my zines so that they are available for free download on itch.io and um, for you to, you know, for people to be able to read through my website and all that sort of thing because it feels important to me that zines should be generally accessible, generally, you know, readable. And I, more than anything, I want people to be able to read the zine. You know, I think, I feel like that's kind of the most important thing. And I would rather that somebody read the zine for free than somebody be turned off from reading it or be unable to read it because it costs money. Um, <laughs> I see it as sort of like incredibly flattering and, and very helpful when someone does purchase a zine because it means that um, I can afford to print them, which is a really important thing for me. And I do uh, offer pay what you want for zines when I'm at festivals and that sort of thing. Um, sort of on the same um, model or whatever, the, the, for the same reasons that... Okay, I definitely mixed these up somehow. But, you know, just on the same model for the same reasons as I would um, want to do that for... Um, you know, digital reading. So I guess I just kind of, I wish that, I wish all zinesters did that. Tons of zinesters do. And I don't mean for this to be like, oh, listen to me, I am so special because I offer all of my zines for free and I am the perfect anti-capitalist icon and everything should be free. And if you can't afford to do that or if you, if you don't want to do that and if you want to be fairly compensated for your work, then that means that you suck and you're part of the problem. Like, I, of course I don't believe that. It's just purely me being probably too hard on myself more than anything else about wanting to be um, wanting to be perfect and constantly questioning does this align with my values does this practice align with my values does this you know and sometimes it's hard because values can be in conflict and people kind of don't talk about that as much as I as as I would like in the sense that you know what happens when when honesty and safety kind of butt heads. What happens when um, anti-capitalist ideals and having to live in a capitalist society butt heads? Uh, what happens when freedom in, of information but also wanting to be credited for your ideas? What happens when those clash? And you know, it's really difficult and I think zines are kind of at the forefront of that because they are very intentionally um, in comparison to other mediums, they are very intentionally uh, countercultural and sort of about about personal expression and and sort of personal expression and representation of your values. So of course it's going to be zines in some way can be a, a battleground of sorts, and it's great because you you can do what you want, but <laughs> that in for me it kind of forces me to look at the way that I am approaching things because when I have the freedom and the, and the capability to do things another way, you know, I, I couldn't dictate for, if, if I were to publish with a traditional publisher, for example, I couldn't, a lot of the stuff I just could not dictate. It wouldn't be up to me whether, you know, how much I sell the book for or whether I am allowed to give it away for free in some cases. It's like, that's not up to me. So the fact that this is up to me in, in the case of zines means that now I need to decide where my, where my values are. And in fact, every zinester kind of needs to do that. So it's sort of difficult because for one, not only do I have to examine my current values, uh, 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 let me change the emphasis, my values, my current values, I also have to respect the values of other creators and it's not always easy to know how to do that because there isn't really a standard for how to talk about zines, how to share zines, 
and it's not generally expected, you know, how much you're going to share or not share. I mean, I suppose there there is some standards in the sense that people don't people expect that if you were to review their zine, for example, you aren't going to share the entire thing. Like, you're not going to just upload a PDF. You're not going to flip through every single page and let everybody see everything. That's that is generally sort of a standard assumption. But the level beyond that, the 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 next question is about exactly how much is enough to share how much is how much is too much how much is spoiling it to the point that people wouldn't want to buy or read it that question is very up in the air i'm gonna take a sip of water here and so that makes it sort of hard to talk about zines sometimes i guess that's kind of the main thing that's been on my mind lately but um, like, what are some other ways to... Okay, so, like, the other main thing, I guess, that um, makes zines harder to talk about than tarot is because they are so unusual, they are so strange, um, that I feel like they're very hard to capture. Like, they're so personal, and they are so unique. Every single one is so unique that it, it feels like there isn't a lot of language... And there isn't a lot of ways that you can fully capture what a zine is, like how, how to describe a zine. Like just for example, if I were to try to describe this zine that I'm folding right now, this tarot zine that I made, I typically describe it as a uh, half per zine and half informational zine that has information of astrology and... Um, an exploration of a particular tarot card. Um, you could go into a little bit more detail about it shows images for, of a particular tarot card from different decks, and um, some of times it goes into the history of tarot decks. You know, I could kind of talk about what it's about, but it's a lot harder, and this, and this is a pro. This is difficult when you're talking about books too. But I feel like, especially with zines, because voice is just so central to zines. How exactly do you talk about the voice of a particular zine? How like I feel like with that same description, you would probably be able to imagine many different types of zines or many many flavors of the same zine. And none of, like, I don't know how many of them would actually be an accurate uh, reflection of sort of the feelings that you get when you read this scene. Um, and that sort of thing, just in general, is so much harder to talk about. And I feel like it's kind of something that you're not trained to do. Like, I'm, I'm sort of thinking back to book report age and, and when you're talking about works and you can, you know... I feel like so rarely are we, at least in America, are we are we taught to examine how a piece of art or how a work, and, and especially how a book or, or like a written piece of work, how it makes us feel, and the mood behind the book. Like, it's always sort of discussed in terms of um, literary or artistic movements, um, like impressionist or postmodern or whatever and so that sort of provides the structure and context um to supposedly understand the work more in relation to um what came before it what came after it and other works of of the era um i suppose we kind of have genres and you sort of have moods for books that you can talk to and that you can describe something as brooding or um, not brooding. <laughs> is it like the gothest thing that the only word that I can think of to describe a mood is brooding? That's so hilarious. But you know what I mean. Like you can just, you, there are sort of different words that you can use to describe the mood of a piece. I feel like in general, there's not a lot of emphasis on that. Like for book reports, the thing I was always asked to do is summarize the work itself. And if anything, sort of talk about 
some of them, like, does it make use of metaphor and imagery or whatever, like, keyword that we were learning about that day. <laughs> and the whole point, and the, the reason that I kind of started hating doing book reports when I was in high school is because I never got to say what I really thought about the book. Like, for example, one time we had to read in A Farewell to Arms, and yeah, I could go in about all of the different, you know, metaphors and how it reflects this or that and how the tone is this or that. Like, I mean, frankly, I can't even remember that much because what I remember about the book now is that I fucking hated it. I thought it was the stupidest thing, and it was basically like, this white guy wants to fuck a nurse, the end. Like, that's basically what the story felt like to me. And it really felt like kind of an example of um, how how dismissive um, how dismissive we are of of women's feelings, and also how dismissive we are of veterans and of veterans' feelings. And like, I don't know. There's just the thing I remember about the book is that I hated it. And a, and a lot of the, t or, or, you know, the way that it made me feel, which was kind, when I was reading it, which was disgusted, annoyed, <laughs> and bored. Um, you can't exactly say that in a book report. <laughs> because people don't really, I mean, teachers, they don't really care how the book made you feel. Um, but I feel like another way that we could approach doing book reviews and book reports is by encouraging you I encouraging those questions about like how did this book make you feel when you were reading it did you like it did you not like it did you feel um sad did you feel scared did you was there anything that especially stood out to you as relatable or not relatable and sort of recenter it as being a reader focused um report or reader reader focused um, study of the work as opposed to a um, work focused study of the work. Does that make sense? Like you're not you're not focusing as much on the content of the work itself. You're focusing on the way that the content made you feel. That is something that doesn't happen very often. And so it's sort of it's sort of hard then because that's really what I want to capture with zines because I think zines almost more than any other type of work make you feel. They make you feel something. A good zine will make you feel something and it will stick with you and it will like like an earworm. It will just wedge itself into your mind. It will change your perspective on things. It will really like affect you and sometimes when I'm reading zines I will get upset I will get angry with the creator I will completely disagree with something but I think the fact that most zines are so um raw and honest and created exactly the way that the creator wants them to when you're interacting with them it really feels more like you're interacting with a person than with a work and so when you're trying to describe the work itself how exactly do you describe that? Because it's like describing a person. I mean, all of this, all this stuff that people say about how difficult it is to understand and work with the court cards, it feels like that, but with zines. And I don't even have the, like, astrological correspondences to fall back on. Um, you know, I could say that this, this zine is like, is like my best friend. I could say that this zine is coming from someone who seems like this or that or you know this is how the zine makes me feel i mean as i'm saying that it it makes me realize that's kind of perhaps i should try to start approaching my zine sharing in that sense of of talking about um making it a reader focus this is how the zine made me feel and and less work focused um because that's kind of what the power of zines is. And if people want to see the work or learn more about the work, that's kind of an easy thing to find out. And, you know, it's kind of, it's not, it's not the same, <laughs> you know, that it doesn't, 
it doesn't fully capture I don't I don't think that a description of a work will ever fully capture the work and that goes doubly so for zines yeah well thanks for letting me chat with you guys because I feel like this has actually been very helpful just <laughs> um, just talking to the camera and trying to figure this stuff out this is kind of why I like folding zines is that sometimes it can be very um, it just gives you time to think it's very uh, meditative it's very um, repetitive in in sort of a nice way yeah all right what was something else that I wanted to say about zines um, yeah the other thing is that they are so unique that a lot of time a lot of times they're just I feel like words can't really do it justice. Um, this is sort of especially the case for zines that are a combination of things, like a combination of illustration and collage and text and poetry and art and all of this stuff. And frankly, that's that's probably a lot of zines are like that. Quite a lot of zines. Um, so it's sort of it's sort of hard just to come up with descriptive words for a zine. Uh, <laughs> and and it it sort of feels especially hard to come up with descriptive words that will that will capture all aspects of a zine and not just some parts of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I guess just to sort of cycle back to the very beginning of the conversation when I'm talking about there's a a very large um, community of tarot people on YouTube. How do I put this? That is something that maybe I just haven't totally found my zine people yet to be able to talk about zines, but there are kind of a lot of a lot of reasons why it's hard to talk to people about zines in the way that you would talk to them about books or the way that you would talk to them about tarot. For one, there zines are so small batch that it's almost unlikely that any two people are going to have the same zine or have read the same zine even like um let me grab the covers here and we can start stuffing them like because a lot of tarot decks are mass market uh you're gonna get a lot of people who have the same decks and thus can talk about them and sort of it's it's likely that you have you have the deck yourself and so you have a basis on which you can talk about it or you can understand it so like and and frankly like okay let me finish my first thought <laughs> so let's take the everyday witch tarot for example that's a very common one lots of people have it and um so when peekaboo rose talks about the everyday witch in different contexts you can sort of have an easier time imagining it because you are already familiar with that particular deck that is made even easier by the fact that we often um, we often see all of the images of a particular deck and so even if you don't know about a particular deck or if you've never seen it before it's relatively easy if you're interested in it to look it up and to have that immediate um, and cheap you know free knowledge or, or that immediate gratification I guess of now you know what the deck looks like now you sort of have context for it and now you feel like you could talk about it and so even though i have never personally owned the wildwood tarot for example i feel relatively comfortable in talking about it in just you know in a casual sense not here's all of the super in-depth reasons you should work with this deck or not you know obviously because i don't have it but it does make it easier because I feel like when someone mentions, oh, the Wildwood Tarot, it's like, oh yeah, I know what that looks like. I can have a general conversation about it. It's not especially difficult for me to um, join in the conversation or at least to feel joined in. That is sort of different with zines because zines are so small run. Um, they go out of print super often. There are few, if any, popular zines that like a ton of people have. And so whenever I'm mentioning a zine, 
it feels like I'm always having to describe it to someone who has never ever seen it and is sort of unlikely to have it, to have read it, or frankly to ever read it. Um, and I have to do that every single time. Whereas it's sort of easy to take shortcuts in a sense when talking about tarot when for example, I could say, this is the Tarot of Vampires by Ian Daniels. I don't have to describe it all that much about what, what it actually is. I don't have to give a, a sense of this is what the deck is. It is a vampire tarot that is based on the Thoth that has these particular images that uses this system, that blah, blah, blah. It's like, it can talk about all those things if I want to, but if I don't want to, or if I don't know how to talk about it, I can kind of just skip it and assume that if people are interested in it or if people need to know that information, they can look it up and they can find it themselves and it won't be all that difficult. You can't really do that with zines um, because if I say, oh, you know, let's start talking about Brain Scan 33. It's like people aren't gonna like, what the fuck is Brain Scan 33? And you can't just Google it, it or, or look it up on YouTube and suddenly see all of the pages and flip through it and, and you know, read it or, or just generally get a sense of what it is. It's sort of, it's sort of harder to do that. And so you have less information that's um, generally available, generally accessible. So that means I sort of feel an obligation to provide that information to a certain extent, which means that every video about zines in comparison to videos about tarot is going to be more work, more descriptive work. And like I said, it's often very difficult to describe a zine without seeing it or without simply just flipping through the entire thing. So <laughs> it's sort of adds an extra layer of difficulty to the um, to the content, you know, to, to what I have to say about it. Um, let's see, what else kind of is there? Um, I guess the other thing, hang on, these are like flopping all over the place. Let me see if I can put these somewhere. Let's put these behind me. Yeah, so, so that is what makes it difficult to talk about zines. Um, also the fact that um, I feel like the uh, zine community okay you know how earlier I was saying there's not a very big zine community on YouTube? Um, I feel like a lot of times, online at least, I've sort of, I've been part of, or I've seen a lot of instances of the zine community. Um, I've seen them on Discord and on um, Reddit has a, has a pretty good big zine community. And what it seems like is that a lot of zinesters are on Instagram right now, which I suppose on the surface makes sense because um, Instagram is built around the sharing of images and zines are often image based. But um, if I may say so, I do not like Instagram. I do not want an Instagram and I I'm kind of irritated in a way that so much cool zine stuff happens there because I really don't think it's the right um, platform on sort of a and does that get through yeah that's fine and I don't think that it's the right platform on sort of an ideal on idealistic level I don't think that its ideals match um, the ideals of zines and I guess it's just because I feel like Instagram is so based around constant content creation. It's based around things looking pretty and cute and sellable and marketable. And, you know, it's owned by Facebook and it's, it just feels, 
maybe this just makes me sound like a big hipster. Maybe there are a whole bunch of cool communities on Instagram, blah, blah, blah. But, like, I've just never been comfortable with it. And, frankly, I think that it's not a good place for building a zinester community. I think it's more of a place for, like, seeing what other zinesters have produced lately. But it, it kind of doesn't seem like it really facilitates conversation around zines. It doesn't seem like it really facilitates an appreciation for zines. And, and I don't know, it just feels kind of uncomfortable. And it feels like so much zine stuff is happening there that, um, I don't know, it just, it feels like the conversation isn't, isn't happening. I don't know how to how to quite say that. Like, I will say that my my best conversations about zines and some of my favorite um, like my favorite connections about zines have happened with individual people. And nine times out of ten, it's people asking to trade zines. Maybe that's the thing that happens on Instagram that I don't really see because it happens through direct messages. I kind of don't know how robust the uh, zine trading community is on Instagram and frankly that's one reason why I kind of have a bit of fear of missing out on like you know if there's a whole bunch of really cool zine stuff that's happening on Instagram that I'm not part of just because I'm kind of stubborn about it or I'm just not comfortable sharing my information on Instagram um, and that is something that I just feel like there's not a whole lot I can do about it beyond trying to cultivate a, a zine community and cultivate zine stuff outside of it that does make me comfortable and that does make me happy, um, which I am doing. I have this YouTube, which I've met already some really amazing people <laughs> through it, and I have been building my own website and I've started looking into Neo Cities, and uh, there's a lot of really cool zinesters that are making websites through Neo Cities, which I feel like that is a platform. It's uh, for those who don't know, Neo Cities is basically like a Geo Cities revival, where it's it's part of the indie web and it's focused on creativity and self-expression instead of um, corporatism and using websites primarily as a way to sell yourself. Um, and so there are some really cool fun, amazing websites. Some of them are throwbacks. Some of them are super simple, basic, like no CSS websites. Some of them are super crazy, color-filled, gift-flashing <laughs> websites. And they just all feel so different and unique and really, you know, not like some websites where you could basically just swap out two people's names and it would be basically the same thing. So that's something I really like about it, and I do think that that's a platform that is appropriate for Z or Yeah, I guess appropriate's the word. Um, I don't mean to say that other ones are inherently inappropriate, but you know, I do think that this is a, wet, a platform and sort of a general creation culture that is um, more in line with the cultural um, themes of zine making, <laughs> like this idea of of creativity, of self-expression. Oh my god, here I'm doing it again. I <laughs> I'm having such a hard time with this. Dean, with this folding stacks. Okay, I think it goes this way. You know, if I'd actually just, you know, cut things and then full, and then flip them over every time, then I wouldn't have this problem. What was I saying? Um... There are places on the web where I feel like there is a really cool zine community happening and I'm really happy to be part of it and I really hope to be able to continue to bring some of that to YouTube uh, because it's really fun making videos and so I guess that's sort of my central challenge right now and the, the thing that I need to sort of work out is ways that I can make zine making okay what did I literally just say Wesley oh my god <laughs> okay 
I can continue making that a culture here on YouTube, and I can, I can, my, oh my god, I'm losing my words. I've been doing this too long. I'm losing my brain. My central goal <laughs> on YouTube, and, and specifically when making videos about zines right now, is to find ways that it doesn't feel like I'm advertising, but rather that I am c cultivating a community of zine lovers, of zinesters, and sharing information and, and sharing zine love and appreciation. That's, the, that's sort of the central word, is appreciation for zines, um, like, there's, there's a difference between music reviews and music appreciation, for example, and simply talking about your favorite music or talking about how it impacted you on a personal level, and that is what I want to try and keep in mind, is that I can do that. This isn't school anymore, I don't have to write a book report, I can simply talk about the way that a zine made me feel, give some basic information so that people who don't know anything about it or are completely unfamiliar with it or whatever, they can... enough that they can generally know what I'm talking about, but just to not expect people to have to have that level of familiarity with a zine that we have with, um, with... oh my god, I know I put that wrong that we have with tarot decks, for example, um, or like the, that we tend to have with tarot decks, or that we're tend, we tend to be able to have with tarot decks. That feels like a, a good conclusion, I suppose, for, for zine chats. Um, it'd be nice if I could have just a little bit more to say so that I could wrap up all of this zine making with you here because I'm very close here to being done with the Six of Swords and this talking has made time fly by so much faster. I've had the same number of Six of Swords to do as I had uh, Judgment but man, for whatever reason, Judgment just felt like it was taking forever. Even though I'm listening to YouTube videos, I'm doing I'm not just sitting here in silence but it's very different um, being able to talk about things, you know. I don't even know how long I've been going, but I'm sure it's been kind of a while. So, I guess for right now, I'll just talk about some zines that I have been working on and zines I have in the works. Uh, that's always kind of fun, right? Um, so, my most recent one is that I finally finished Unfair Maiden number three, which is the homecoming issue. I started that one last um, winter, or like last November or something, when I first moved here, and it kind of took me a really long time, but I am very proud of the result, and I feel like it sort of expressed exactly what I want to express. Um, so let me move these, so I can get these out. So I'm really happy with that. Um, the other thing is now I'm trying to decide if I want to go ahead and do another one of these tarot zines. I mean, I definitely want to, but just if I want to do that right now. Um, I've sort of gotten out of the groove with <laughs> with making these tarot zines. The Six of Swords was the last one I make, last one I made, and that was last year sometime. I don't even, don't even totally remember. Did I write it down somewhere? Probably on the cover. Um, I'm sort of thinking about doing the Moon tarot card because, frankly, that's a tarot card that I don't totally understand fully. Like, I kind of get it, but I don't get it at the same time. And that's kind of the purpose of these zines, or that was the original purpose of these, was to explore a, a card more in depth because I didn't really know anything about it, and, you know, my knowledge of the tarot grew a lot faster than I was able to make these zines, uh, but I think that would definitely be a good sort of return to the purpose of these zines, so I'm thinking of doing that. And I also kind of want to do the moon because it's come up for me a couple times, and also because uh, one of my favorite tarot tubers, Aquamarine18, Laura at Aquamarine18, uh, the channel name Aquamarine18 comes from 
uh, number 18, which is the moon card. And I just, I, Laura, if you, if you feel like you have an intuitive understanding of the moon to the point that it's your favorite card and you feel really connected to it, I mean, maybe that's not why it's your favorite card, but I, I would appreciate any, any insight you have or any direction that you have. But yeah, I think it's a, I think it's the right time for me to, to do the moon card. I'm going to be moving soon and I'm hoping that the new place will just be a lot more conducive to, um, zine making. Okay, hang on. This is one of those ones where I screwed up the folding. Okay, six. And there's a siren in the background too, so we'll just pause a second here. Six, seven, eight. Six, seven. That's not seven, that's twelve. Six, seven, twelve. Okay, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh my god. Here's another eight. So I have a spare of that. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. This is the nitty gritty of zine making, the stuff that nobody tells you about. <laughs> um, it is fun. I'm having fun. <laughs> Oh my god, let me make sure that I have these. 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, those should be good. Just these ones that I managed to mix up a little bit. Okay, 8, 9, 10. Alright, so far so good. Which means these were flipped over the wrong way. Oh my god. Whatever, I'll just keep going. I'll make it, I'll make it happen. I'll make it work. Zero. Six, eight, ten, eight, ten, zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. Zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. Okay. Zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about all this, but you know, you knew what you were signing up for, right? You were signing up for me fucking around with collation for <laughs> the entire time. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm kind of wanting to work on a moon terrazine. The other one I'm doing is one that kind of was another one of those zines that just came out of nowhere but has been just incredibly fun to do and I'm calling it Accidental Otaku <laughs> and it's basically me talking about um, all of the manga that I've read and now enjoyed so much after my job as a teen librarian because we have a very robust manga collection in the um, in the teen room of my library and so naturally that's something that I wanted to get to know a little bit better just to get to know the collection and to be able to make recommendations and that sort of thing and it turned out to be really cool, really fun, and a genre that I, you know, not that manga is a genre, but, you know, a, a category that I had never really um, fully explored before. I know a lot of people have their manga phase a lot younger, <laughs> like when they're kids, but I never did. Um, so now I've been, I've been enjoying myself with that, and I just kind of ended up doing some little reviews of manga that I've read and I looped my sister into it because she is a giant manga fan. She is definitely an otaku, like, crossing over into weeaboo territory. <laughs> um, so she's been writing some stuff for it with me. Um, I've had a lot of other zines that have, like, I've started on it and then it's been on the back burner and I've never really... Uh, finished finished it especially some mini zines or one-off zines like I've had one where I'm going through some um uh what do you call it like some old medieval images and just some stock fo stock um 
art that's not the word i'm creative commons like like art that's old enough that it's that it's in the creative commons now and finding a bunch of old artwork of animals that just looks really fucking stupid like just not at all like the animal itself like if you've ever if you've ever seen medieval uh, manuscripts that try to draw horses that's kind of the idea i'm trying to like collect a whole bunch of uh different really wonky looking <laughs> animal images into a zine and um it's really fun but i feel like i'm just not uh I'm, I'm having too many formatting issues and it's just been such a pain so I think I need to kind of reorient myself in that one. I need to like, I'm thinking maybe I just need to do it traditionally because I don't mind doing like arranging things digitally but I feel like it's just not as fun as doing physical collage so maybe what I'll do is um, just print off a whole bunch of these and I'll put them together in a uh, physical collage zine. I mean, that just makes it so much easier for me. I do all of my um, Unfair Maidens in physical collage. I don't usually do uh, these drawing room tarot zines in physical collage just because um, they're so text heavy that it's actually easier to arrange them in pages, like the Mac version of Docs. Anyway, so that's kind of what I'm working on. And then I've got Unfair Maiden number four in the, uh, in the works, which I'm gonna, I'm sort of temp temporarily, the working title is the Riot Girl revival issue. Um, because like manga and anime, something that I didn't really discover until ironically, after I was a boy, <laughs> was Riot Girl music and the Riot Girl movement, and I totally, I just totally love it, and I've grown a new appreciation for Riot Girl songs, and I'm listening to a book right now that is so appropriate for that, um, <laughs> for Riot Girl stuff. It's called The Punk Factor. It's so funny, and it's, I mean, it's, it's not like a humor, a humor book, but all right, it's a story that's about like a girl band in London, and it feels like such a realistic band story. It's not tropey, and it's the whole thing about like we're breaking up the band, I'm going solo. It's all about like the very early stages of a um, of a punk girl band, and the lead Frankie is so believable in that she is sort of a compulsive liar and and really not in in a in intentionally bad way but in the way that she's trying to talk herself up and she wants people to like her and she wants people to be impressed with her and so she's always talking about things like um you know trying to sound cool trying to make the sound the band sound bigger than they are but also make it sound like it's not a big deal that they're super big where you know she's trying she's says stuff like um oh you know we're just a couple of girls trying to make some noise here we're not not uh out to make it big but we've already got record labels in it you know like record labels have been interested in us they're going to show up at the next sh at our next gig but it's really no big deal, like, <laughs> you know, just just going on about it that way. Um, and then the other main character, Haruna, has a life that is kind of similar to the life that I had growing up, and it was really tough, and she's kind of the person who actually has something to rebel against, and I'm, it's sort of like every time that she actually does something to truly express herself on the drums and truly express herself in in riot girl form you just root for her so much because she's got such a shit life at home anyway so it's it's been really fun to um read or uh you know listen to the audiobook version of that book so far i feel like i've kind of gotten off on a tangent and i can't totally remember what i was talking about um riot girl yeah <laughs> so maybe i'll do a proper showcase of riot girl books in the next issue of Unfair Maiden. Wouldn't that be kind of fun? <laughs> um, I also totally want to find another artist to do the cover for Unfair Maiden because 
sort of since the beginning, I've ended up having other people do the covers for Unfair Maiden, starting with just this really rad eight-year-old. Hang on, let me grab the covers again. Wait, there we go. Covers again. Look at that, we're almost done. See, look how much faster this goes when you have some friends to talk to. It's so awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so I've had Aishamir Yashin do a cover. I've had a really amazing artist named Lottie do the cover for issue number three. And now I'm going to have to find somebody to do issue number four, just because it's, it's like one of my, it's one of the most fun parts about the Unfair Maiden series is to get someone else to do the cover and do a really cool drawing for it. Um, so if you know anyone, or if you yourself are interested in being commissioned to do the cover for Unfair Maiden number four, the Riot Girl revival issue, then you know how to find me. <laughs> I'm right here. Look at that. No extras. That's good. None missing. That's good. And we are almost done. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping that this will end up motivating me to actually talk more about zines and get over these weird, these weird humps and these weird fears and these weird things that just make it feel more difficult because, you know, the whole point is about sharing things. Ooh, that one didn't come out as well. Oh well, it's unique. It's one of a kind. The whole point about, about YouTube and the whole point about me talking about zines is just to share zines that I love and share, share the zine love, like I was saying. Um, so I'm gonna continue doing that. Look at this. I think there were 50 of these. I guess we'll do a final count. That'll be the grand finale of this uh, fold and chat video is me doing a final count of <laughs> um, all the zines that we folded. And then at some point I'll have to do Knight of Cups, but I'm... my mouth's getting dry. <laughs> I gotta get more water or something. <laughs> see what else is on the horizon. International Zine Month is coming up. Maybe I'll try to take that as an opportunity to finish some of these in-progress zines that I've had going for a while, because I have more than just the um, the animal men and the um, animal and the anime ones that I'm doing, so I'll It'd be nice to sort of get those totally finished. And I really want to get everything uploaded on to Itch so that everybody can read it, and especially these tarot zines too, because I feel like they would appeal a lot to some of my new and lovely followers who came for the tarot and hopefully are going to stick around for the zines. <laughs> if you don't, that's fine. Everybody, you know. Watch what you want to watch, follow who you want to follow, unfollow who you're bored with, like, you know. It is your, your feed, and they are your interests, and you can develop them however you want. And this is the last one to be stapled. One. <laughs> Two. Hooray! I'm gonna get such beefy arms doing zine staples, especially if I keep going here. That is it! That is all of them! All of the sixes of swords! Let's give a big final count! Just, oh my god, they're gonna slip and slide all over the place! Ah! Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 
31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Okay, so it's 40, not 50. But that was pretty good. That was a very good, productive time, and thanks so much for letting me jibber jabber for uh, for this long. I will see you later with more fabulous tarot and zine sharing videos. See ya.